Robert R. Rees, right? Right, uh-huh. Okay, good morning, sir. Yes, hi, how are you? And uh, you've, got, you've got a book out now, too, also. I didn't know this, this, this uh, article that I, that I was reading here about the James Dean uh, bedeviled car here was, uh, was in the Fate magazine, but I guess you have a book out now. Now, is the book out on James Dean, or is it on the car? What, what exactly is the book about? Right, the article you were talking about was in Fate magazine, and then the book I have out is called James Dean Beyond the Grave. And uh, it kind of concerns the paranormal side of James Dean, or the supernatural or psychic side that's not always been uh, delved into. Okay, what, what's this? What's this big fascination with James Dean? You think? Well, as you know, uh, it continues. Uh, he died 41 years ago last week, and last week they uh, reissued his movie Giant that was made 40 years ago. It was his last movie, and they reissued that to movie theaters. Uh, last week uh, to play in major cities in, in normal, regular theaters. So it's, it's very unusual that somebody uh, continues to have this influence 40 years after their death. You know, the movies are still in theaters. They're on the current postage stamp. And um, the only people like that that I can think of would be maybe Marilyn Monroe or Elvis Presley. Uh -huh. And it's strange. You know, they all came from the 1950s, and yet somehow they're all uh, current and timely and topical, and people continue to identify with the image and symbol that they put out there continues to be this fascination for him. Okay, okay. I remember reading, reading things about that, the, the movie Giant, too. You got, I remember, um, of course, the Rock Hudson was in it. I thought that was one of the worst acting jobs Rock Hudson ever did. But, uh, well, and that was Oscar nominated <laughs> I know. for that, as well as Jimmy Dean. I couldn't believe that. <laughs> and I also heard that James Dean, um, when he was in that movie, uh, during the, t the scene where he was uh, um, loaded, that they had to redub his voice again because uh, they couldn't understand a word he said. So That's correct. Uh, he had just had it written into his contract that he was not to race his uh, Porsche Spider, which is the car he would die in. Uh, he could not race that car until Giant wrapped up shooting. And as soon as Jimmy finished his very last scene in the movie, he took off for the races and he did die in this car accident on September 30th, 1955. Uh, his portion of Giant was finished, but they still had a week or two for some of the other actors uh, to work on the film. And in the last scene where he's supposed to be in an alcoholic stupor, uh, he mumbled some of his dialogue so badly that they did bring Nick Adams on uh, to go ahead and, and re-loop or re-dub Jimmy Dean's final words on the screen so they're, uh, you know, understandable. Okay. All right. All right. So I, I remember reading about that a long time. Anyway, um, one, qu one thing that uh, we were, when we were talking on the phone a few days back, about this uh, James Dean car thing. Before we get into the car part of it, now I never realized that there was somebody else in the in the vehicle with James Dean. Right. Uh, a lot of people are not aware of that he um, he had a, a Porsche mechanic by the name of Rolf Wetherich, and uh, he was a German fellow that had been a Luftwaffe pilot during World War II, and then he went to work for the Porsche factory, and he was in California working at Competition Motors, which is where Jimmy Dean bought the Porsche in 1955 out in Los Angeles. And uh, Dean insisted when he bought the car, it was $7,000 back then, which in 1955, that was a lot of money for a sport car. Uh -huh. And uh, in fact, there were only 90 of these cars ever made back there in the uh, mid-50s. And Jimmy specified when he bought the car that this guy, uh, Rolf Wetherich, who was a, a real good mechanic, that that guy would accompany him to uh, any of the races and see that the car was kept perfectly tuned up. So when Jimmy was driving the car that day, this guy was in the car with him. And uh, Jimmy died in the wreck, but this guy was thrown clear and was, uh, you know, beat up pretty badly. And he was in the hospital for a year, but he did survive the wreck, but then went on to have a tragic life. Okay, can you can you fill us in a little bit about this guy's life? I mean, that was yeah, affected? Yeah, uh, after, after the wreck, he was in a hospital for a year, and uh, he tried to uh, first sue James Dean Estate, and then he ended up suing the other driver of that other car's estate to uh, collect some money to try to help him with his hospital bills, and uh, he ended up going back to Germany in the 1960s and working for the Porsche factory, but it was kind of like what people say about Muhammad Ali, if you get hit in the head too many times, are there some problems, and it was like uh, Rolf Wutherich had been involved in several car wrecks, and they wondered if this did something to his brain, because uh, he got pretty wild in the way he... Uh, carried on, and he was in a lot of bar brawls, and he became an alcoholic, and he was quite a womanizer, and when he did get married, uh, in 1968, he stabbed his wife to death, he killed her, and they uh, called it insanity, so he was put in an institution, and then after a while, he was let out, but uh, he continued having problems holding down a job and being stable, and by 1981, 
Rolf himself would die in a car accident back in his own hometown in Germany on a wet night driving a Honda. You know, he ended up by himself sliding off the road and crashing into a house and dying in 1981 in a car wreck. Doesn't die in a Porsche, but he dies in a Honda? Can you believe it? What can I say? <laughs> okay. All right. Now, getting to the car. Now, I, the car wasn't totally wrecked, I take it, so they they were actually, what, cut up pieces of the car and sold them at an auction or something? Or what? How did this... Yeah, the way it all started, uh, once, once this wreck took place, you know, it tore up the car fairly badly, but it was mainly the front end around the fender area, and it pushed the engine back, and... Uh, there were still a lot of good parts left on the car. And so, uh, like I said, it was a $7,000 car, and uh, it was purchased for $2,500, the wreckage. And the guy that purchased it out there in Los Angeles was the name of uh, George Barris. And uh, most people are familiar with Barris because he's the guy that is the famous king of the car customizers. He still shows up at car shows all over the country. And he's the guy that built the original Batmobile. Okay. He built the Munstermobile. Uh, the kit car from the Knight Rider series. You know, when it comes to anything that somebody needs in the way of a special car, George Barris usually has uh, has done the work on it for the last 40 years. And so, uh, anyway, so he went ahead and purchased the car for $2,500, and uh, he started parting it out. And the first thing he did was uh, sell the engine of the car to a guy named uh, Dr. Troy McHenry, who was an L.A. physician, and his hobby was car racing. And then he sold the drivetrain, the uh, transmission drive, the transaxle, sold that to another doctor. Both of these doctors put the car parts in their cars, and they were both in the same race at the Pomona Fairground in 1956, a year after Jimmy's death. And both of them ended up in car wrecks that day. One doctor was killed. The doctor that had the engine in the car was killed. And the doctor that had the transmission in the car was badly hurt. <laughs> and uh, so it's strange, and that's where it started from there, and it seemed like kind of like, you know, where Mary and her little lamb, wherever the lamb went, trouble followed. And it seemed to happen like this with the car as far as parting it out was concerned. He, uh, he went ahead, George Barris uh, sold the, the tires off of the Spider, And, of course, uh, within a week, the uh, tires both blew out, and this caused the driver to be run off the road. And at this time, Barris decided that it was best to quit parting the car out because for whatever reason, it just seemed like everything went wrong. So instead, he just decided to put it in storage but he was asked to take it out of storage uh, by the uh, California Highway Patrol because they were thinking that maybe this would be an interesting uh, traveling highway safety exhibit, you know, oh, okay. on James Dean, and, you know, this could happen to you if you don't wear your safety belt and if you're careless or speeding or whatever. So they decided that they would use this then as a traveling exhibit. But the uh, the curse continued and strange things, you know, kept happening. <laughs> the curse continued. Wait, when, they, when they were transporting the car, things would happen or what? Yeah, well, uh, okay, part of the time, like, uh, one time it was uh, in storage in uh, Fresno, and uh, a fire broke out that burned down the whole building, and it destroyed every car that was in the building except for the Porsche. Of course. And it was slightly scorched. And uh, then, like I said, he uh, crate this, this car up and start sending it out, and there was a fellow named George Berkowitz that was an employee of the state of California, and he was hauling this death car on his flatbed truck, and he lost control of the vehicle, and he was thrown from the cab, but he was killed when this wreckage tore loose from its mooring, and it pinned him down beneath its weight. Huh. Now, th this car, uh, now is, is, it's been misplaced, or, or I, I guess was there's still, what, the uh, the transaxle is still available, and uh, and people can, can, I guess, can still purchase this, but the car itself, was it misplaced, or what happened to the car exactly? Yeah, uh, well, after this one guy was killed, uh, you know, the, the car... They started touring at about 1956, mm -hmm. and uh, for a while, not too much happened in 57 and 58. And then in uh, 59, the car slipped off the truck, and it broke into two pieces on the highway, and that caused a wreck. And uh, then by 1959 in New Orleans, uh, the thing that had been welded together fell apart into 11 pieces, mm -hmm. and they put this thing back together again. Finally, uh, the way it wound up, uh, in Florida, in Miami, they had asked to... Uh, again, do this uh, safety exhibit situation, and uh, they did their act down there in Florida, and then they went ahead and crated the car up, and they sent it by freight to send it back to George Barris out in Los Angeles, and a week had passed, and the car had not arrived, and so, uh, you know, Barris thought the car was on its way, but it didn't show up, and so he checked into it, and he even 
hired a private investigator from Pinkerton's to check and see what happened. So finally, the uh, the freight car does arrive late in Los Angeles, and then when they uh, unseal it and open up the door and open up the crate, there's no car. Huh. So by 1960, the car had vanished, and uh, it has not been seen since. So of course, the speculation is, you know, was the car stolen? Uh, was it simply misplaced by somebody? Does it still exist? You know, there, all those questions are still around. Or is the person who stole it uh, still alive? To Again, to... yeah, yeah, exactly, because that's been 36 years. Yeah. And I can't help but wonder, like the end of the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark, did it end up just falling into the wrong hands uh, to somebody that didn't know anything about it in a box someplace just pushed to the back of a warehouse and maybe finally just uh, scrapped? You know, you, you wonder... Uh, how something like that does turn out, and it's hard to tell. It has been 36 years. Hmm. So, but but there's still uh, uh, the transaxle is still available. So that's the only thing left that's of the, the car. That's the only part. Yeah, that, the uh, transaxle, which had you know one of the doctors had been uh, wounded or injured badly when he had uh, used this in his car in '56. He would take that out of his car and he would sell it. And the transaxle, you know, had a serial number on it, and it has been located. And there's a fella out in Los Angeles who is restoring a Porsche Spider. And he is using the original uh, drivetrain or transaxle from James Dean's Spider, and he is using that in his restoration. And last I heard, uh, he still has the car, and he's asking, of course, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars for the car. And so far, he's holding on to it. Huh. But he, has he has he driven it yet? Uh, I'm I'm not sure about that. Okay, all right. Huh? The I'd be a little hesitant myself. <laughs> yeah, same here. I'd rather sell it and get it out of my get it out of my garage. But I, yeah. Huh? That that does that did this ever um, cause somebody to write the the movie Christine by chance? Yeah, it doesn't. It does make you think that, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah. Because uh, it seems very very close. The, the strange thing is, all the stuff we've talked about is not just conjecture and hearsay and speculation and myth. Instead, this is all uh, factual truth that can be backed up by legitimate newspapers, not things like uh, the Enquirer or the Globe or whatever, right. but actual uh, factual reporting. And it's a very strange story. Uh, you know, which again makes people wonder, well, how about uh, the people that work with James Dean on Rubble Without a Cause, his most famous picture, because a lot of strange things happened to his co-stars from that film. Okay, now, just just out of curiosity, name, name a couple of things that happened out of... Okay, uh, well, in the 1960s, uh, Nick Adams, who was one of the co-stars from Rebel, right. uh, he died of a drug overdose from Peraldehyde in the late 1960s. In the 1970s, Sal Mineo, that was in the film, was uh, stabbed to death in the mid-70s and killed outside of his apartment in Hollywood. Then in the 1980s, Natalie Wood mysteriously drowns off the coast of uh, Catalina. And then uh, the main love of Jimmy's whole life was a woman named Pierre Angeli that was kind of a minor B actress back in the 1950s, and that was the main love of his life. And she died of suicide before she was 40 years old. Okay, okay, so... Uh, of course, that's uh, it. Could be related to just tragic Hollywood, but uh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, it's it, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. All these different things happen. Uh, uh, as far as saying there was a curse on the on the car or whatever, I don't know. But uh, it's, it's it's just very strange. Very strange. Um, now, as far as your book goes, now um, it's not in bookstores yet, so but it can be ordered. Right. Um, the number is to order the book. Okay, the book is nine ninety five plus a dollar ninety five postage, and it's called James Dean. Beyond the Grave, and my name is Robert Reese, R-E-E-S, and my address is 20806 Park Canyon in Katy, that's K-A-T-Y, Texas, 77450. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. This has been very interesting. I, I, I always find this kind of thing, this kind of stuff fascinating. I don't know why. It's odd, and especially we're in October, and we're headed towards Halloween. Halloween. And it was just the anniversary of his death last week, so the timing on this seems right, too. Yeah, there you go. Thank you very much. Oscar, I enjoyed it. Thank you. And we may talk, we may, you never know. We'll talk to you again maybe about your book when it, when it gets uh, gets huge. I'd be, I'd be glad to. That'd be great. Okay. Thank Take you. care. Mm-hmm. Bye. Bye-bye.